year trial and the first year is double blind, uh, randomized double blind trial so uh, patients and myself we don't know who's getting what, the SIBO or the drug and uh, <clears throat> so most patients are in her final uh, first year so they passed the first year they're coming now to the open phase it's the second year is it's an open treatment so every every patient gets the drug well, which is biotin what, uh, it's it's biotin it's a vitamin vitamin h uh, and it's a high dose um, uh, uh, treatment of 300 milligrams of biotin per day so um, is this for AMN or ALD? AMN. There are only AMN patients included in that trial. So patients without any cerebral brain involvement. So both men, men and women? Or only men. Only men. Right. So this is a company called Meday Pharma, which was um, spun out of actually a metabolic urology unit at the uh, PDSL Pentier. This is right, is it Frederick Sedell? Yes. And they decided that they are primarily interested in MS, actually, and biotin being a good treatment for... Right. There are two uh, studies in MS, uh, or pre I'd say pre preliminary studies in MS, showing some uh, uh, improvement of uh, walking uh, abilities in these patients. These are used in chronic MS patients, so which is a condition which is maybe clinically why it's a little bit similar to, the, to what we see in AMN. So that was the idea that we also use this in AMN patients. And uh, in MS there will be a larger study, uh, a randomized control study coming up now. So also included in this patients uh, with, chronic, with chronic MS conditions. So uh, this drug may um, influence uh, neurodegeneration because the biotin is a cofactor in uh, a metabolic cofactor um, which also helps to remyelinate uh, 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 myelin and uh, so this is the idea it's also a, is um, involved in the energy metabolism I told you yesterday that there is some problems with the energy metabolism in AMM condition as well. So it's, we hope that it is helpful in AMN. So we will have a, an interim analysis in the AMN study, uh, I would say within the next six months. Uh, Patrick Obo and I would be decided to look at uh, the, the first year uh, after every patient is entering the open phase. So then we can do an interim analysis if this is helpful. But uh, for the final results, we have to wait for another, let's say, one and a half years. And it's not still recruiting? No, they, it's, the recruitment is completely <laughs> done. As I said, most patients are already in the second year. So they're not recruiting anything at the moment, I'm afraid. Now, biotin is something you can just buy from Holland and Barrett. Um, but that wouldn't be the same biotin, according to uh, Dr. Sedell. They have super biotin. <laughs> There may, have, however, be other things also. I mean, I, there is probably another, at least one other trial that may get going in the next 18 months or so. So there may be other things people with AMN can get involved in. Okay, are the other questions going to appear? We are shouting at the hotel now. I've got one more. <laughs> and this one is about low fat diets. Um, so is there, now let's see if I can get this right. Low fat diets are good for everybody, which is true up to a point, although I think fat's coming back in fashion now, isn't it? And it's actually low carbohydrate diets that are good for everybody. Um, so even if you're not taking Lorenzo's oil, would you expect that a low fat diet would have any uh, exo extra uh, efficacy in, in people with AMM or ALD? Probably not, I think, is the answer to that. I mean, it's, it's good, but it's not going to normalize your very long chain fatty acids, not without the Lorenzo's oil. No, uh, we, we have no uh, really results uh, showing any kind of efficacy just with the, the diet. Uh, you, it, it is possible by modifying, it's not a low fat diet by the way, 
uh, which is used currently in, in our patients. It's a modified fat diet. It's not low fat. Yeah. Uh, but it's a modified fat diet and this is leading. We have uh, a lot of uh, measurements made. Uh, you can lower the melanogen fatty acids just using the diet. That's possible with the, with the new kind of diet. But uh, it's usually not normalizing. For normalizing, you need uh, uh, to uh, block the, uh, the, the end endogenous uh, production of uh, brain long chain fatty acid as well. Uh, and this is only possible with, uh, uh, with something like Lorenzo's oil or maybe the new Italian oil or whatever. Um, <clears throat> well, but of course, as I said yesterday, the both the diet and the combination with Lorenz's oil or other oils, um, um, there, there is a, in my eyes, there's a chance that it may have some impact on the on the long run for AMN patients. But it's not that there is any randomized controlled trial that's showing that there is a clear uh, effect on on your health right away, or it's not. It's nothing that it's improving. But it's, it may have a change on the long run uh, concerning the new degenerative aspects of ALD. And that's my clear opinion. Uh, and uh, well, the future will show if it's true or not. Okay, so it's, yeah, so the diet, it's a diet that's low in C26, but then yes. you, have to, you have to stop your body from making C26 out of the other fats, which is where the Lorenzo's oil comes in. Could you do it? placebo controlled trial? You'd just feed them, you'd feed people back the C26 with the Lorenzo's oil. I don't, I don't think that we, we will have enough money or inputs to have a randomized controlled trial in, in, a, in a diet therapy. We had this uh, uh, Baltimore group tried to make a, a randomized trial and uh, as you all know this trial was stopped for some reason I, I, I don't know exactly because this trial is still not uh, published and I blame the group for that because I think it's uh, unethical not to publish results from a, from a trial which is done so I'm still waiting for results from the trial because I wanted to know what was the reason exactly uh, and what was the results so far because it was uh, done I think two or three years before, before it was stopped. So <clears throat> this was the, a, a big effort and a, uh, a good chance to show if the dietary treatment is helpful, yes or no, but unfortunately this trial was stopped in the US and uh, so I don't think that we will have the chance to do another thing with Lorenzo's oil. Maybe, maybe there are other oils uh, uh, coming up and we, I, I've been in Italy four weeks ago uh, to discuss with the company uh, to do a uh, controlled randomized trial on the new oil and maybe we'll have that at least in the price. We'd also probably have to go on for quite a long time. <laughs> well the current idea is to have a short track uh, pilot study with the uh, with the new oil um, because it's I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, call this a dietary treatment. We, we decided to have this as a, as a new therapeutic option because it's, it's, not, it's not the oil itself. It's also including a mixture of uh, antioxidants and, and also this uh, conjugated linoleic acid. So this is, this is a, a new idea uh, which we have to test on. So we, we decided to have some uh, uh, short trial using um, uh, metabolic endpoints, not clinical endpoints, because in six months you wouldn't see any clinical endpoint. And hopefully this would uh, convince authorities to get an approval at least for a, for a, for a clinical trial in, in Europe. So this is, uh, this is the idea currently. So <coughs> if this comes to be, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I've run out of questions that are more coming. Good. Um, I've got a question about the accuracy of genetic tests. My son died um, 10 years ago. My daughter was tested and found not to have the gene. 
can I be absolutely 100% certain that she does, in fact, not have the ALDG? Yes, no, we don't have anyone who does genetic testing. And you feel <coughs> this is going to be the difference between sequencing the whole gene and doing I mean the, CDNA? The, um, so I assume that your son was genetically tested and so that they do know what the mutation was in your son? Yes. And so what they would do then is look for that specific mutation in other family members, which would have included your daughter? Yes, she did have the test. So, and I'm just wondering, you know, if she comes on to want to start a family, yeah. I'm not going to feel entirely happy that the test was right. I know that's probably me being completely I think paranoid. If they're looking for a specific mutation, they're not going to tell you it's not there unless they're absolutely sure. Right, okay. So I think as far as we can possibly say, then that result is, is accurate and... Great, it, thank you. Yeah, so that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, the, so you may occasionally get situations where somebody has to buy a chemical and clinical picture. So it would have been yourself and they sequence the gene and they don't find anything. Now that's much more difficult because there are different ways of sequencing genes. But I think once you have a mutation in the family that's been proven, uh, then the labs are very good at finding that. Thank you. The worry with genetic tests, the worry with genetic tests tend to be the other way around because of the pseudogenes, the other gene-like copies of this gene. It, 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 it's easier to actually overcall mutations rather than undercall them, so the error is usually in the opposite direction. You know, they found the mutations that definitely caused the disease. That's slightly the bigger worry. So you, your daughter would be very wise to um, visit a geneticist before she starts her family? Well, she has already. Great. We've had the... Recently done that. No, that was um, when she was 16. She's now 22. It, um, so. so that's relatively recently. Yeah. But um, if she was planning a family, if you had a diagnosis maybe 10 years ago, you would you'd definitely want to discuss because there would be some quite complicated discussions she might want to synchronise between geneticist and obstetrician. Anyway, if she's clear, it should be fine. If she's clear, it should be fine. That's right. correct. But if you if you are any doubt about that at all, you can make, you can discuss that. Okay. So we're still looking for the written ones. So you'll have to own up if you put questions in the bucket. And <laughs> <laughs> ask them yourself. <laughs> Um, so, in my previous life, before the diagnosis, I was a primary school head teacher and also an inspector, so I kind of have a little bit of the legal side where the school might be coming from. I certainly know about my son's school because he has an emergency high course zone injection. So, it all comes down to insurance and liability, and um, it depends on the local authority. So, the head teacher would need to have that conversation with the local authority about whether they're actually covered to administer the drug. Certainly in my son's school, Gloucestershire, the schools are not covered by insurance if they have to draw up, is that the correct word? You draw it up from a file. Yeah. Um, so whereas they could administer an EpiPen um, or an insulin-based preloaded, they can't do that for hydrocortisone. So then what happens then with the child to So on Sam's care plan, um, we've agreed that basically it'll be held in school and um, there'll be a fast response car. Okay. So the paramedics can give it when they get command. Okay. You know what to add to that? I think that was pretty comprehensive. Good. Yeah, it, it, it's good when the families answer the question first than the doctors. It's really good. <laughs> <awesome. laughs> Not unusual, is it? <laughs> Brilliant. I'm not sure I'm going to read she, so you can no. <laughs> My eldest son, um, he's stable, but now 
active disease at the moment. But what he would like to know is, will he get further brain involvement? So is he, he's had a transplant at some no, point? No, no, he was too far gone. His um, score was 12 to 13, but the disease is just haunted. Don't know why. I'm not going to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> How old is your son? Um, 19. 19. 19. Um, and your question is whether he will get further brain disease? Yes. Yeah. So, so in, in general, uh, progression of brain disease usually happens in, 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 in one wave, and, it, and we don't really see, uh, as in multiple sclerosis, multiple um, you know um, attacks of progression so I would say that um, I'm sorry who am I talking to you um, I, I would say that if it's self-halted it's self-halted what you will probably see over time is some degree of spinal cord disease setting in over over uh, you know the next decades so I would be a little reassured you know regarding the brain but uh, you know, brace yourself that there might be some uh, chronic progression um, otherwise. So it'd be more like AMA. So AMA, 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 yeah. But yeah. yeah. Patrick did mention some. So I think Professor Arborg mentioned one patient that I don't think any of us have had experience of where somebody with supposedly arrested uh, adrenal dystrophy, which is what I think we'd say your yeah. son's got, actually had progressed 12 years after their diagnosis of their arrested ALD, I think. So, you know, I think sadly, although we'd like to be 100% reassuring to you and your son, I think we have to say that this disease can almost always catch us out. And let's hope it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I guess we could also have some Doctor and doctor action. If anyone wishes to ask any of their colleagues any questions, please. Yeah. 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 Have you been through all the the questions? Because I've only got two, and there are a whole yeah. there are a whole load of, apparently somewhere. Um, Karen's looking for them Karen's now. The hotel has moved them. Well, my question was a bit broader. Um, we've heard a lot about the research going on into therapies and <coughs> trials which will help AMN and ALD. But the one interesting thing that has never been talked about, uh, which was talked about years ago when I used to come, is myelin repair. Is that a taboo subject? Or is anybody <coughs> doing anything about myelin repair? And I, I'm well aware, of course, as, as was pointed out yesterday, that for AMN it's not a myelin problem, it's an axonal dieback problem. So, this is again, I think. Myelin repair is something that interests me. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of uh, research in myelin repair that's gone on over decades. I think there are also uh, big companies that are involved in for MS, uh, you know, for MS right? Uh, whether it's uh, Biogen or other uh, companies that are actively working in this. I will say that um, for we would love to have myelin repair strategies for after transplantation or also for uh, AMN. In AMN, I think the, the, the myelin defect is, is different than what we yeah. expect in multiple sclerosis. It's not in, in actively inflammatory and, and it's probably more the relationship of the myelin to the lung tract that, that's impaired. So, um, so I think it's a little more, more complicated. There are some compounds that are showing some progress in MS, and we're, we're actively looking at that. But um, I will say we'll take progress from wherever it comes. And uh, more recently, it seems to come more from the field of hematology, in my opinion. So I'll take that. Wolfgang, did you have to say that? Well, I don't think that I can add something more. I mean, it's it, it's it's in progress. There's indeed there is a broad uh, research uh, interest in uh, remyelination uh, strategies, especially in MS. Uh, but um, uh, up to now, there's not a not a single drug really effective in in, in doing that. So. Um, 
since this is urgently needed um, in MS, I think research will go on, and I hope that there will be some success in, the, in, the, in one of these compounds. And as soon as we have that uh, in flooring, if we have that in, a, in MS or other uh, white matter diseases, we also will try to use this in the patients as well. A bit like the biotin, really, which has gone from MS to AMA as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, related to uh, pre implantation uh, genetic, genetic yeah. diagnosis. Yeah. So, uh, would it be possible to also do uh, HLA matching uh, in yes. The embryos? Yes. Yeah. Um, PGD, or pre implantation genetic diagnosis, can be used oh, for. Oh, here, I'm sorry. Yes. <coughs> sorry. So PGD can be used for tissue typing, essentially to find what we would call a donor sibling. Um, the legislation behind it until recently has been a bit complicated. So in 2001, uh, you could only do PGD for tissue uh, typing uh, in order to use umbilical cord blood and nothing else. And this changed in 2004 and now the legislation under the HFEA states that uh, you can have this technology, PGD, uh, to find a, an HLA-matched donor sibling in cases of bone marrow transplant as well. This is done on a case-to-case -case base. So the couple or uh, the person that uh, once is interested in this uh, type of technology will need to apply to the HFEA through their IVF clinic or through their doctor, and it's done on a case-to-case -case base. Looking at the circumstances, or judging by the question that you're asking me, I'd say that in these circumstances we would expect this application to go through. So yes, this is something that is being offered. And also, um, success rate of um, this uh, working. Um, it must be dependent on maternal age. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it drops with. Yes. So if we look at this IVF treatment mm -hmm. without any type of genetic analysis, uh, life birth rates before the age of 35 are more than 40 percent. Uh, life birth rates over the age of age of 40 drop to 20 percent, and over the age of 44 they drop to less than 5 percent. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the age of the woman undergoing the treatment is one of the most important factors in the success of this treatment. Mm -hmm. Can I just confirm, so that's embryo testing and selection based on finding a, a donor match for bone marrow, is that right? No, the, these results uh, refer to all IVF treatments in the oh, UK. Sorry, the, the, the oh, yes, 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 yes. So let's say you'd need to, an embryo that was HLA match and didn't have the ABCD1 mutation yet. How yes. many embryos are you going to need? What's the chance of that? So, on an average 30 year old <coughs> woman undergoing IVF. Sorry, I meant on the, from a genetic point of view. Yes. What, so, to have, not to have the ABCD1 is going to be a, a 1 in 2. But for an HLA match, how many embryos have got a full HLA match? Colin probably will know that. <laughs> so one in four. It's, it's one in it's four. One in four. One in two. So it's Yeah. So it's. So it, But but you, you know I've I've done several transplants with what people historically call savior siblings, where the, the sibling um, the sort of family have had a child already with a genetic disease, they wanted another child or children without the genetic disease, so they needed the PGD, um, and then there were enough eggs to look around and find a tissue type embryo and then that child was born, and either their cord, usually their cord blood is stored, but quite often, perversely, we actually prefer to use bone marrow over the cord blood. Sometimes it's a bit more successful um, in the number of cells and the engraftment. Um, and, and so uh, we've actually ended up harvesting the bone marrow from the children that I've done, and actually using both the cord blood and the bone marrow together to maximize the number of cells. But, as, you know, they've been incredibly successful transplants. They've not been done for adrenaline dystrophy, but obviously I showed you that the sibling transplant results in general for everybody have, have been technically very good. Of course, some children have still progressed a lot because if they were done late in their disease, but other than that, the results are good. So I guess that's another potential benefit of a newborn screening program is it gives you time to... Yeah, very definitely. Can I just... 
I do think this is a complicated area. The, the diseases where the tissue, the PGDTT, which is what we've tended to call it. Have you changed that, or am I still allowed to call it PGDTT? So, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and tissue typing all, all together. The diseases where I think that's easiest for us and for the authorities like the HFEA is where you definitely, definitely know that you're going to have to do a transplant. So if a child has thalassemia and they're needing red cell transfusions every three or four weeks and they're gradually loading up their body with iron, it's much better for them to have a transplant from a sibling. So the sibling is born, perhaps you don't use the cord blade, but you wait till the baby is one to two years old, you harvest the bone marrow and then you probably use both. It's a very clear cut situation. Fanconi anemia is another one where the bone marrow fails and blood count falls and falls and falls and you need red cells and you need platelets just to stop you bleeding. There, once you've got the marrow, you're going to want to do the transplant. The difficulty in this disease is that you would be almost doing what we call a rainy day collection, where there's possibly a 50 or 60% chance that you wouldn't actually want to use that. Or, if your child is already deteriorating, you're never going to have a newborn baby cells in time to actually be able to use them. So I think it's quite, it's quite tricky and it, it would need very careful thinking through. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, if you could uh, go through that uh, like rainy day collection again. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, so supposing that you've, supposing that you've got a child who's, this would usually, it's complicated, but it would usually happen in a situation where you've already, already got a boy who's got a dream of dystrophy. Yeah. Um, well, if we, we can talk about our case uh, specifically, because we, our son just got the diagnosis and he's uh, not turned two yet, so he's early, a very early diagnosed. Yes. No symptoms other than uh, adrenal uh, insufficiency. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's a, a big okay. chance that he, he, in the future, will need yeah. to go through a, a bone marrow transplant. Yeah, but. The but as I said, there's no certainty. No, you, you, no. you know, and there's, indeed, as a child, there's a 60% chance that he wouldn't yeah. need to go through a bone marrow transplant. So there's a 60% chance that you'd go through all of this, uh, and, and and then actually never need to use cells. But, but if you're doing PIGD anyway, because you want to select, is there an extra ethical dimension to adding in a second thing to select for? No, you or? might just you might just reduce your your chances. I think it comes back to your comment. You always want to select the best embryo. Yeah. The chance that the one that's tissue typed is the very best embryo and so on, you know, you're just pushing your chances of the PGD working, of, of the IVF working, uh, perhaps a little down. So it's lucky, it's lucky if it works, basically. Yeah. Thanks. On the similar vein, probably already asked it. So could, um, for an IMN man who then develops cerebral IOD, could you possibly use, potentially use a son's? Okay, so that's what we. So the sun, <laughs> the sun would be um, uh, would almost certainly be what we call a haploidentical match. So um, parents and, and their children are usually half matched with one another because you get half of your tissue typing from your mother, half from your father. Um, so that's a situation we call haploidentical transplants. And actually, haploidentical transplants have been done for decades, but they've often been very difficult. Um, more recently, people are doing them in a new way, <coughs> which is a, it'll sound a bit crazy, but you give quite a lot of chemotherapy to kill a person's bone marrow. Then you give them the haploidentical cells. You don't fiddle with them at all. You just collect all the cells and give them to the, to the person. And then you give some chemo on day three and four after the transplant. It's not very powerful chemo. It's called cyclophosphamide, and you just give two doses of it. And what happens is that um, I always talk about the... T lymphocytes as being the archers in your body's immune army. So they're the things that spot viral germs in particular and other people's tissue. Um, and they also, after transplants, are the things that cause complication called graft versus host disease, where the T cells think, I'm in the wrong body, I don't like it, I'm going to attack it, it's a bug. They see it as a germ, basically. It's not, it's not them, it's something else, and therefore they attack it. So... Basically, um, what happens in these transplants is that the T cells go into the body, they go, whoop, don't like this body, it's not mine. 
start breeding, start releasing chemicals, often cause fevers and rashes and things like that potentially. And then you're giving this chemotherapy a few days into that, and that kills those breeding T cells. The trouble with that sort of transplant, although technically it's, it's um, more successful than it's been in the past, is there's high rates of virus infections with it because you also kill the T cells that are starting to try to fight the viruses in the person's body. Um, so there's very high rates of infections. Um, and also there's high rates of graft versus host disease. So Florian naughtily suggested to you yesterday that the rates of graft versus host disease were about 40 to 50 percent. That's absolutely wrong, I'm afraid. That's historical data. And, and using modern approaches to bone marrow transplant, I'd be telling people it was more like 10 to 15 percent. And indeed, I sometimes wish I saw more GVHD in transplants because GVHD helps to fight the donor cells and it helps to take you up to 100 percent donor in your blood. Um, so um, there's about a half of the people are getting graft versus host disease, and We've known for decades that graft versus host disease is not good in adrenal dystrophy because it's another immune process on top of the immune process that's attacking your brain already and it just tends to speed it up. So technically possible, not being done. Uh, I've got two children who've had haploidentical transplants many years out. Um, uh, one of them is great uh, and one of them is <laughs> looking right. Um, has, I mean, if we just talk about his transplant, didn't get graft versus host disease from it, has plenty of persistent donor cells, but has a hemolytic process where he likes to break down his red blood cells, and that's an immune attack process. And that's the sort of thing we don't like to see. So they are complicated. So what you're, um, so what you're talking about works, is something you definitely do for solid organ transplantation. So if you're looking at living donors for kidneys and increasingly looking for livers as well. But the issue there is that you, you're less likely to get rejection and there is no graft versus host disease because the liver and the kidney are not the immune system. So it's different, for, it's different when you're doing bone marrow. Um, this, this might be a little bit more complicated. I don't know if you uh, experienced having a patient. For myself, it's uh, sickle cell negative. I had a girlfriend who was sickle cell negative. <laughs> so they went to the counseling and the civil cell society and they said if they want children in the future they have to, you know, go through the idea. But yeah. well, now with this AM and I don't know, have you had any cases like that? Well, with sickle cell and AM and or yeah, ARD? Yeah. No, I haven't, but I don't I don't see that that would affect it in any way. I don't think the two diseases would conflict in that. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they would affect one another at all. Because it's already, you know, they were worried about the sickle cell trait, two sickle cells. Yeah. Positive so it's trait. through genetics. Yeah. <coughs> uh, we have recently had a very similar case where uh, two partners each had a distinct severe genetic disorder and they came in asking to have PGD to identify embryos that have neither of the two disorders. Um, they went through multiple attempts only to find out that all the available embryos had one or the other condition and we're talking about conditions that are significantly worse than sickle cell trait. Uh, in cases like that uh, it's obviously very difficult to decide what to do. It depends on which center you're having your treatment at. For example, guys in St. Thomas's.